Hello again, welcome back to IndyCar on the last day of January uh, of 2022. So the 31st of January, moving into February tomorrow, um, well, a number of things have really started to change. The one that uh, particularly caught my attention this morning was Boris Johnson's new plans uh, to introduce a bill which will allow the Tories to scrap much of the uh, European Union's regulations, which are currently part of the uh, of the uh, United Kingdom's laws now, ostensibly the reason that he's doing this apparently is so that they can remove red tape, and there has been much talk of Brexit benefits. In other words, uh, removing much of the supposed bureaucracy, which is supposedly holding back uh, British trade with the European Union and other places. However, it's uh, unlikely that this is going to do anything very much, because uh, apart from anything else, if you remove the regulations which are in place specifically to permit the easy trade with the European Union by matching their standards, then effectively you're making the trade more difficult because the European Union has then got to try and establish whether your regulations, which you have now basically uh, remember that abandoned the, the European Union's regulations in favour of these new UK versions, the European Union then has to try and establish whether these regulations are in any way similar to what came before. And that's going to cause more bureaucracy, not less. The, um, the Prime Minister seems to be going down this route because it's been a catastrophe, Brexit, so far, with reports of up to 16 hours of waits for trucks uh, heading towards Calais on one side of the channel and an equal number of hours waiting uh, to get into Dover. It's also been said that uh, Scottish trucks, which are travelling uh, obviously from Scotland towards Dover to go to Calais, uh, are actually getting preferential treatment. Now, apparently the reason for this is that much of the, the truck traffic from Scotland is carrying fresh fish, which needs to get there quickly, and therefore I think they're probably prioritising those trucks ahead of others which are not carrying anything which can spoil. However, the same problem exists. And that's not to mention the problems with Northern Ireland and its protocol, which have a completely different set of rules to the rest of the United Kingdom, where they cannot remove these European Union regulations at all, because it would completely uh, destroy the Northern Ireland protocol. Well, perhaps that is the idea behind this. However, it's hard to find any kind of sunlit uplands to Brexit, even if Boris Johnson manages to uh, remove some of these regulations it's not something, incidentally, which will require parliamentary scrutiny either. If you're successful in using this uh, parliamentary device, this method of, um, of changing laws, basically what will happen is they'll be able to change laws without any parliamentary scrutiny, without any debate, and without uh, the Westminster Parliament being able to do anything about it. So basically it seems that nobody from uh, other parties will be able to say no to any of these changes. However, that's not the only thing that's going on this week. Um, it's also noted this week that the, the price of Brent crude, the kind of crude oil which is produced by the North Sea, has exceeded $90 a barrel for the first time in a long time. So the price of um, hydrocarbon fuels is rapidly rising, and that's not to mention the spiralling costs of natural gas as well. All of this shows that um, Scotland has lost out massively over the, ma the last, what, 50 years of oil production as the United Kingdom decided to sell the rights to oil exploration cheaply and are not taxing the oil industry in the way that they could be doing. So Scotland is missing out on millions and millions of pounds worth of tax revenues from the North Sea and that's just obviously going to continue now. Not only that, but uh, Rishi Sunak and the Prime Minister have decided between them that it's time for a rise in national insurance contributions. Now this will mean anything uh, between an £89 per year rise for somebody uh, on a, a roundabout sort of middle income and in, the, uh, in Scotland that is somewhere in the region of the low uh, 20,000s. Anyone on such an income will be expected to pay somewhere around £90 extra in national insurance every year and higher tax earn, uh, t higher taxpayers will be expected to front up more than £400 more in their national insurance contributions. Now the reasons given for this hike have been to provide extra funding for the NHS. 
Now, this is a bit strange considering the fact that Brexit is supposedly providing an extra £350 million a week, which is supposedly going to the NHS. So why is a national insurance hike needed? The sunlit uplands of Brexit told us that we would be getting all these extra hundreds of millions of pounds a week by leaving the European Union. So why is it necessary? at all to increase the secondary form of taxation when it's already being paid for by Brexit, according to the Tories. Well, unless somebody's been telling porkies, and in fact we're not getting £350 million a week. In fact, the figure was rounded down substantially to about £190 million a week uh, in savings on EU membership fees. However, even with that, why do we still need a hike in interest rates? Uh, sorry, a hike in uh, national insurance rates, I beg your pardon. However, some good news for Scotland this week, and, and that is that the daily COVID figures are still falling with, uh, I think, today's announcement of 6,100 and I think it was 150 or 160 new cases per day. Now, that still sounds like a lot. But when you look at the so-called R number, and that is the uh, the rate of transmission, it's now fallen below the magic one number. It's now 0.8. So one person with COVID-19 is now expected to infect 0.8 of a person. Uh, and that basically means that the, uh, the COVID pandemic and the huge spike that we saw recently is now over. Effectively, COVID is back under the NHS's control and they're able to cope with it. And the, uh, the anecdotal evidence that I've been hearing from doctors whom I know uh, have been that many of the wards which had been transferred back to being COVID wards are now being repurposed back to their original use as the need for them has decreased again. So this is very good news. It's just at the right moment as well, of course, for the First Minister who is planning to announce the uh, presentation of the Independence Referendum Bill to Holyrood in the coming weeks. And we now expect that to go ahead as we come out of COVID. So it couldn't have happened at a better time, really, for the First Minister that uh, this is now under control. And all the measures that were put in place by the Scottish Government appear to have worked well and are keeping that number from rising. In fact, it is gradually still descending. Uh, it has gone from over 20,000 uh, cases a day at its peak a few weeks ago down to just 6,000 now. So it's on an ever-decreasing uh, curve, and I expect that to continue into the next few months. So we now can look forward to hearing, uh, I hope, in the next few weeks, the uh, independence referendum bill being presented to Holyrood. And at that point, really, that's the starting pistol, because as soon as that bill is read, we would expect the bill to contain three things, three pieces of information. One is who will be allowed to vote in this referendum, and that will include uh, all the different demographics of the people of Scotland who will be allowed to vote. It will also say what the question is, and it's widely expected to be exactly the same question as in 2014, because basically uh, the argument has not changed. We're still voting about independence, and therefore the question doesn't really need to change. Nothing uh, about independence and becoming independent has altered in any way in the intervening eight years. And the final thing will be the date of the referendum, and that will uh, be contained in the bill as well. You would expect it to be contained because... The SNP needs to put in at least a provisional date in the bill so that it can be discussed. It's widely believed that it will be towards the end of 2023, uh, mainly to avoid a whole series of other uh, items on the list, not least of which is the upcoming council elections in May. Uh, I've already, I don't know about you, I've already received some, uh, some information from the Green Party asking for my vote for more Green councillors to be elected. And I'm sure you will see much more in the next few months from other parties as well looking for your vote. In the meantime, the Tories have gone quiet. Douglas Ross is probably hiding somewhere after uh, jettisoning his own Prime Minister recently. And now that the Prime Minister looks like he's going to survive all of the so-called Partygate allegations, as the famous Sue Gray report has now been delayed for weeks, if not months, it looks like the the heat has gone out of the uh, the whole scandal of Partygate, and it's now just a simmering ember. And by the time any of this information comes out, then I think most of the uh, the arguments about Boris Johnson and Partygate will have subsided. 
and be eclipsed by all of these new things that he wants to do, including raising your uh, national insurance rate. And of course, this new bill, which will remove many of the EU's uh, laws and regulations from the United Kingdom. Now, it does have a secondary effect. Uh, of course, the devolved administrations, both the Scottish and the Welsh administrations, uh, are warning that this is going to undermine devolution because much of what is contained uh, in Scotland's parliamentary powers was devolved uh, when we left the European Union. Certain powers came back, although there weren't that many of them, certain powers came back to the Scottish government, uh, which allows them to rule on certain things. I don't know whether those will remain after these new laws are passed. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if these new um, if this new snatch of power back from the EU by Boris Johnson includes taking all these powers back from the Scottish government, it might well do. But whatever it does, if it removes European regulations from Scotland, then that is going to hamper our entry back into the European Union once we are independent, because we will have diverged substantially from European Union standards. So there is a potential uh, fall in, uh, what should we say, that the necessary conversion. Scotland needs to be following the European Union's regulations fairly closely in order to rejoin. And if these rules are removed by the British government, that makes it all the more difficult for us. And of course, that is something which Boris Johnson will probably be delighted about. He'll be able to remove some powers from the Scottish Parliament, and he will also be able to make it more difficult for us to rejoin the European Union. All of which means that the urgency of independence is increasing all the time. So we can't wait past 2023. In fact, it may well be that there are strong arguments in Holyrood for advancing the date of the independence referendum to much earlier in 2023 if things get much worse. Anyway, that's about all the news I have for you today. But just remember that if Boris Johnson succeeds in removing these uh, European Union rules and regulations, then Scotland is going to have a harder job rejoining the European Union. We're all going to be poorer because of the, in, the uh, national insurance rate rise. And I'm talking about all of us who earn money uh, paying more. Uh, for the NHS, which was supposed to be paid for by the Brexit dividend of £350 million a week. And with that, as I say, oil prices going higher than $90 a barrel, I think you can see that Scotland is missing out badly uh, on a lot of income, which we could badly, you know, we badly need when we become independent. So when we do become independent, it would be nice if the Scottish government, which at that point, will have inherited an awful lot of territory in the North Sea, but to renegotiate all these licenses and also to include taking a cut of the profits from all the oil sold. Anyway, that's about it for me today. I'll see you again tomorrow. I uh, hope you've enjoyed today's program, but as usual, contact me if you have any news. Incidentally, uh, talking of any news, it just reminded me, the item I talked about yesterday regarding uh, I think it was for uh, licenses for mining in the borders of Scotland and Galloway. It looks as though the licenses that were being talked about were actually exploration licenses, and these allow companies to drill boreholes looking for deposits of metals in the border area. At the moment, uh, these companies are saying that they haven't found any deposits yet, and it's only if they do that there will be any licenses given by the Scottish version of the Crown Estates for the extraction of minerals and ores. Now, even then, it has to go through an awful lot of planning and an awful lot of environmental consent and things before that can happen. Mining for metals, particularly in the modern age, um, is often done as an open cast mine and each can be extremely detrimental to the natural environment. And the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency may not allow such mining in certain areas. Anyway, that's the news for today. As I said, I will see you again tomorrow. In the meantime, any news stories that you have for me, contact me in the usual channels. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.